Hi everyone, and welcome to lecture 11. Now, this will be the last video that I send to you, all right? Normally, when we do the in-class uh, face-to-face, uh, there, week 12 is really nothing more than just students picking up papers that maybe you know they, they hadn't picked up before, or maybe getting their, their quiz back or what have you. And so it's really informal. And so I also think that by the time we get to week 11 or class 11, whatever you want to call it, you guys have a, a whole lot of stuff that, 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 that is coming due. So I figure there's no point in, in asking you to do another lecture, right? So anyway, so as I said, this will be the last lecture, all right? Now, I may send an email out or what have you. Um, and so, so as it is the last lecture, be aware of one thing I'm about to say, which, which you, may, you, you may think, really, did he mean that? Okay, today we're gonna do a comparative analysis where I'm gonna show you how to do comparison and contrast, all right? But I don't want you to do that for this course. Do not do any comparative analyses for your final take-home research paper, all right? Don't. So in other words, if you read between the lines, like I said, you really don't have to watch this lecture. But hang on to this lecture in case you are asked to do a comparative analysis down the road. I'll show you how to do it. I'll show you. There's, there's a, a few different models, like a few different methods that, that we can use uh, to do a comparative analysis. So it, it, it'll be handy to know the material that I'm showing you here, but you don't need it for this course. Hint, hint. Okay, okay. Please don't email. Really? Did you mean that? Yes, I meant to. Okay, but but as I said, but hang on to it. Hang on to all the lectures, by the way. I think they're they'll, they'll be helpful for you down the road in all of your writing. Okay, but this one in particular, hang on to it just in case, just in case, right? So anyway, so I'm going to spend the next hour wasting my time and your time showing you how to do something you don't need to do for this course. Okay, all right, right? We all understand. Okay, so um, let's get right into it then. Pointing out similarities is called comparing, and pointing out differences is called uh, contrasting. That 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 simple terminology, right? And so when we assess both similarities and differences, we're engaging in what is known as comparison and contrast. There you go, all right? Now, quite often, people will use the term comparison to mean comparing, contrasting, or both. And so, like, let's not get, let's not get too hung up on the semantics, right? Basically, what we're, what we're dealing with here when we look at similarities, differences, comparative analysis, all right? And so that's why I have that bolded for you. Okay, now, Comparison is, it's, a, it's something, it's a mental process, something we do all the time. If you think about it, wh whatever you chose to wear today, all right, uh, unless you're just sitting at a computer like me, right, where you didn't have to worry about, <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> like, your pants matching your top and all of that, right? But um, it's something we do consciously all the time. So if you chose your outfit for the day, if you're going out for the day, you're comparing, right? You look at your closet and you, you figure out what goes with what, all right? And so when we are doing a comparison, okay, basically we, we want to think about three questions and they're very obvious, very obvious, but then I'll get more specific as we go along, all right? What are the main similarities between S1 and S2? Where obviously S equals the subject matter. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a, a, couple, a couple of subtle things that we can do when it comes to something that goes back to our subject headings, right? So you'll, you'll see, you'll see how everything kind of falls into place, all right? So we have what are the main similarities between S1 and S2. Then we have what are the differences between S1 and S2? Obvious stuff, obvious stuff, right? Then what are the main similarities and differences between S1 and S2? But, but do you see now, the second that we look at number three, how all of a sudden this, this can get very vague, right? When we start looking at similarities and differences, but what's the whole point of, of the comparative analysis? That's the, that's the issue right, that we want to be aware of, especially when it comes to writing a university paper. Like, am I just showing comparisons? Am I just show, uh, sorry, am I just showing similarities? Am I just showing differences? Like, like, we could go on and do that forever, couldn't we, right? So that's why I said, be careful. At the end of this lecture, I will give you the questions that you should probably ask if you are ever, like, if, if, if an instructor ever says, we want a comparative analysis. I've got some good questions at the end of the lecture that you know that you should ask just to be nice and specific. All right. But as I said, 
You don't need to do it for our course, okay? All right. And so maybe, maybe in school or maybe at work, you're, you're, at, you're, you're asked to evaluate, right? How would you go about evaluating something? And so um, maybe you are asked, okay, you want to evaluate the differences between, like, like similarities and differences between an IBM and Mac computer, okay? And so how would you go about doing that? Well, organizing a paper then, okay, is is not difficult if you just if you ask these three questions, okay. So we're on, we're going to go on page two now, all right. And now this is this is really interesting, okay. Those of you who are still following this lecture, the first question, obviously, are the two items really comparable? Now it's really interesting, like the writing process. It's 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 interesting how you can manipulate information. Because if you go back and think about it, all right, are the two items really comparable? Well, at first glance, and I'm going to show you an example in just a second. At first glance, you may think, well, no, th these two things are not comparable at all. Ah, but if we start manipulating language, manipulating terms, all of a sudden we can make comparative analyses work. So let's just see. Let's just see what I mean by that. Number two, what are the terms of comparison? And notice terms is bolded. So, okay, so does that sound familiar? In class, if we were in class right now, I would be I, I, I would pause here and I would say, can anyone tell me another word that we could put at the end of that line, okay, that would substitute for terms, the terms of comparison? Well, guess what? It's your umbrella terms, your section headings. All of writing works the same way, it's just, just subtle differences, right? So the terms of comparison become then your umbrella terms or your section headings. There it is. So, and I know that's repetitive, but literally that, you always wanna think about that when it comes to your own writing. What are your terms of comparison? What are your subject headings or umbrella terms, et cetera? And then finally, what is the most appropriate pattern okay, of organization to use? And I'm gonna show you the, the various patterns that, that, that we can utilize. And so basically then, you want to make sure that you impose, if you think about it, a kind of meaningful similarity between the two subjects, whatever subject or however many number of subjects you, you're utilize, or you're using, but you want to just impose a sense of order. That's how writing works. Okay. And you've learned, like I've shown you that by now, right? If you go back, it's interesting, go back to the 15 steps we talked about, right? And imposing a sense of order. Order isn't something that just appears. You want to impose it. Okay. Okay, so basically, yeah, when we look at our two subjects or how many, so we'll pretend we're doing two, all right? They must have something significant in common. But as I said, but you can kind of impose that as we'll see. After deciding that your two subjects are comparable, um, then really you, you should consider the terms of comparison, okay? Sorry, that was a bit repetitive, but here's my example now. Let's just say, let's just say, you are asked to assess two engineering firms. Okay, wouldn't make it wouldn't make a lot of sense to compare the management structure and computer systems of one firm with the uh, washrooms and cafeteria food of another. Okay, so and yes, I know that's an obvious terrible example I'm giving, but let's just say I manipulated the language. Okay, resemblances and differences. Okay, can be assessed in terms. Okay, it, sorry, it can be assessed in the same terms and categories if we just play around with the language. So how about your report could be organized, okay, in terms of the following, management structure, computer systems, employee facilities. All I'm doing there, I'm, I'm simply playing around with words, right? But by playing around with those words, I'm actually creating my areas. How many times have I said that throughout this course, right? The areas, the how am I going to get from one area to the next? That's the difference between writing a really well-developed argument or whatever, and just simply stating a whole lot of random points. So you always want to be thinking about that in your writing, all right? Re regardless of whether it's argument or, or, like, or the discipline, there's always some kind of structure, development, okay, to the paper, okay? So, and so, like I said, this is almost a review, isn't it? Well, it's not really a review, but you know what I mean, right? We're, we're, I'm saying the same thing over and over again. And so, basically, 
you want to avoid using subjects. Okay. Oh, sorry. So that's the next point. You want to avoid using subjects as your headings, except in rare cases. All right. And so what do I mean by that? Let's just take a quick look. So let's go back to our computer analysis. Okay. I've been authorized to purchase a computer system for my place of business. And I've been given three options, okay? And they are as follows. Computer A, computer B, computer C, okay? Or computers A, like system A, right? You follow what I mean. Now, there's many aspects that I might wanna consider relating to each computer, right? But I've determined that the three most important for my purposes, or at least for our, our, our business purposes, would be price, speed, and maintenance, okay? So we've got P for price, S for speed, M for maintenance. Now I want you to just take a quick look at something here, okay? How could we do this? There's two ways we could do this, and I just wanna show you how to avoid repetition. Well, in model number one, okay, I could start with my purpose and scope, my introduction, however you wanna go about that, and I could go computer A, and then, Price, speed, maintenance. Computer B, price, speed, maintenance. Computer C, price, speed, maintenance. But now, this is where uh, the clever writer starts to realize, okay, that, that pattern could get me into a bit of trouble because I have a funny feeling I'm gonna be saying the same thing over and over again in each area, right? So instead, why not take a look at model Two, purpose and scope, right? My, my in introduction, basically. Price, and then speed, then maintenance. That's what I mean by the subjects now, computer A, computer B, and computer C, are no longer the subject headings. Instead, we have those other terms, and those terms lay out how we will go about this entire analysis, okay? Or analysis, all right? And on the next page, you'll see I have an example with uh, with novels, all right, with novels and film. But but just notice the, the the subtle difference there. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but I guarantee you, if you do model one, you'd end up repeating yourself, or at least the paper would would be very tedious. It, it, like it would fall into a kind of generic pattern, right? Remember remember a long time ago, well not too long ago, I, I mentioned this whole idea that if you've been taught, you know, have your three points every paragraph, three point. It just makes for tedious writing, right? That's exactly what would happen in model one. But in model two, well now, because I'm dealing with price, speed, then maintenance, I can pull in whatever I need, right? Okay, like wh whatever computer I wanna talk about. But I know that there is development there because of my subject headings. That's what I've been trying to show you this entire course, right? So there you go. And then finally, you'll notice at the bottom there, it says recommendations. Sometimes, like not necessarily for university, but when, when you get into the workforce, um, maybe you will have to make recommendations, right? When it comes to you know purchases or what have you, and that's more or less the way the uh, any any kind of uh, model like this would work. And so, um, yeah, so think about your recommendations almost like your conclusion. Okay, all right. Now notice. It is up to the writer to choose which pieces of information will serve as headings. That goes back to, oh boy, in the 15 steps to organization, I think that was number six or seven. You have to impose an order, right? And again, we've been doing this the entire course. So it is, like I said, it's almost like a summary. And then you can manipulate, right? Depending, finding the right words to serve, to, to serve as your subject headings. That's the way writing works, simple as that. And so that's also how we end up creating structure in an argument, right? We have those areas that we work through, right? And so once we feel that there is an apparent structure, okay? That what, uh, sorry, once we, uh, what, when we feel there is no apparent structure, sorry, okay? Then we have to impose one, okay? So, and, and so sometimes we'll get lucky, right? Sometimes the, the order will just kind of appear. Maybe it's chronological, right? Quite often, but not always. And so then that's where you know the writer has to step in and say, okay, this is the this is the way in which this material will, will unfold. All right? Okay. 
And so, yeah, top of page four, there it is. What we must do is create, impose the structure. Sorry, like I, I am being repetitive. Last lecture of, of the course, right? Some of you aren't even paying any attention anymore. anymore. So, that, and that's fine. So the only thing now I need to consider, okay, is basically, yeah, uh, how will I go about ordering everything? How will I make sense out of it? 15 steps to organization. Hang on to that, right? From long time ago, okay? Hang on to that. It works, all right? It works to give you a sense of structure. And so, if you remember as well, once we have our areas, right? Well then, chances are, I mean, I could go back to page three just for a second here. Once I have price, speed, maintenance, well, I can break those down as well, can't I? So my price might be one area I work through, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's just one, one paragraph, right? I can, break it, I can break that down as well. So we have, and I think in the notes it says here, yeah, we can break down okay, into subordinate groups, right? Like subsections, if you will. I've got my main area, but then I can break the area down into sub areas, right? Okay, so and and so that's then how your paragraphing works as well with your organization. All falls into place. Everything falls into place. Okay, right. And so, yeah. What if I uh, uh, have many apparently unrelated pieces of information? That's another question that that might come into any writing process, right? Well, first, uh, again, I'm going right back to the 15 steps. Lay out all of your information in front of you, okay, from your research. Then remember, are there similarities? Are there differences? Can we group those things exactly the way we did it with the 15 steps that I talked about, right? And, and as you do that over and over again, notice in the notes, you'll begin to develop a knack for that. So it's just a matter of creating structure, okay, organizing, right? Before, before you start writing. So remember, I've said this a thousand times, build your paper, don't write it, build it. And once you built it, then write it, okay? If you build it, they will come, okay? Field of dreams, no? All right, anyway. And so some possible headings, like whenever we're trying to think about the, the, you know, the possible umbrella terms or whatever, well, historical, statistical, uh, environmental, I've thrown these at you before, right? Family, a uh, genus, uh, or genus, uh, family, political, economic. You know, you're just looking for those headings that that group um, that that are able to serve as an umbrella term for a group of ideas. Okay, you're looking for groups. You're grouping. Okay, then of course, as I said, then you have to order. So, so you build. And so the possibilities, you, you can tell just the way I was saying that <laughs> the possibilities are endless, right? They're endless. But, but the key is not to just start writing. The key is to start figuring out how do I put this thing together, right? And so, yeah, there it is right there. Sometimes you'll end up with a perfect grouping, but sometimes you won't. And that's where then you have to manipulate. So once you've done all that work, well then the next thing you need to do is figure out, all right, what is the appropriate structure for your comparison? And there's there's two basic ones. I'll show you. No big deal. There's two different uh, types. One is known as the chunk pattern, and one is known as the slice pattern. And these they're not my terms. If you if you look up manuals like like in any writing manual, if they're looking at comparative analysis, those are the terms that they'll use. So we have the chunk pattern and then the slice pattern. This will make perfect sense when you see. Okay. Now that I think about it. This lecture usually goes much longer in class simply because you guys don't have the notes in front of you. Now that you have the notes in front of you, this should be a breeze. We, we might only go 30, 35 minutes today, okay? And so let's take a look at the first one, the chunk pattern. Chunk pattern, very straightforward. You separate the two subjects, okay? We're going to pretend we're only doing two subjects, okay? So we separate the two subjects and we simply deal with one subject and we go through the entire analysis. Then we deal with the next subject and we go through the entire analysis. So you can see there are both con, uh, pros and cons to something like that type of structure. Okay, so let's do it, right? Again, I'm going to do it quickly. So let's just say you were asked to compare a novel and a film. Okay, I think the example I might, hear, I might have here, uh, maybe I don't. But I just think you know, it doesn't matter. Harry Potter. 
doesn't matter what, but, but you're going to compare the novel to the film. All right. And so you might want to focus on, yeah, characters, the setting and the plot. All right. So here is an example of how we would go about doing that with a chunk pattern. Okay. The chunk pattern. Paragraph one would be your introduction with your thesis and everything else. Then you would have the way I've written it in the notes. I've got paragraph two, but I also have section. Okay. So section one, right? Your first main area that you'll work through. So we've got S1, subject one, the novel. Then we've got characters, setting, and plot. Then we have section two, which I guess could fall into paragraph three, but that could be, by, by the time we get to it, it could be paragraph six, seven, and eight, right? You, you follow, right? In other words, our introduction could be the first paragraph, then, then the second section, character, paragraph, setting, paragraph, plot, paragraph. Now, we're, now we have four paragraphs. Then we get to section two, now we're into the fifth, right? You, you follow, we've been doing this so much with each other now, we, we, you understand what I'm getting at, okay? And so we do the same thing again, characters, setting, plot in the film. But now notice how this could be a bit problematic because if we have a longer piece, okay? Let's just say we had a 20 page paper, okay? I always say 20 pages, I don't know why. Let's just say we had a 20 page paper. Well, can you see how this could be problematic if we were to set up our comparative analysis this way? Because you end up then with a 10-page paper and another 10-page paper, right? And so by the time the reader like finishes the reading process, the reader may not remember anything about the novel and will only remember about the film. Okay, okay. So the overall structure then of the chunk comparison, okay, um, would be better suited to shorter papers. So let's just say you had an essay question on an exam. Let's just say, okay? And they asked you simply to write one page. Just do a quick comparison between two things on one page. Okay, then the chunk pattern would work. But as we get further along, as we get more complicated, more complex, then the chunk pattern probably won't be your best choice. And so what would we do? Well then, in that case, we might move towards something called the slice pattern. And again, remember, these are not my terms, I'm taking them straight out of textbooks, but, but they work, but they work. And so in the slice pattern, now we're on to, my goodness, we're on to page six already. Yeah, because you're not writing it down in class, I've given you everything. So yeah, I figured maybe 30 minutes. So the essay structured in slices, could communicate the exact same information, except, okay, the outline would look uh, quite a bit different. So in a sample template that I have for you, all right, we would have first paragraph as always, right? Introduction and thesis statement, right? But then we would have section one characters. So notice in, in a strange way, I, I, I wish I could be, I wish I'd be clearer in what I mean by this, but. Notice it's not the subjects that become the umbrella terms, all right? Instead, it, it's character, setting, plot. They become the subject headings. When I say subjects, what I mean is, like, like you, you it, let's just say you were doing a comparative analysis with a, a novel, and you had character one, character two, character three. Those were your subject headings. That would not work very well, because I can almost guarantee you, you will create repetition. That's all I mean by this whole idea of, Instead, you have character, setting, and then plot, okay, or whatever, or whatever. But but uh, you want to avoid you want to avoid repetition, okay, as much as possible. And so we have section one. Now we'll deal with characters. And notice now we can move fluidly between the novel and the film. So notice the difference here, right? It's nowhere near as rigid as the first one. Then we move into our next section. Call it what you want, area, whatever. Then you have, you know, setting, but we move between the novel and the plot. All right. Again, so like I said, more fluid, just it just flows better. And then finally, plot. My, by the way, those are not the best subject headings. Right. But but I'm, I'm just trying to show you the difference between the slice, the chunk and the slice. That's how you would do it. So I think if you had a longer piece, right, if you if your essay was, say, 15, 20 pages, 
you can obviously see how this would be a much better choice, right? Okay, the, the slice pattern. So the slice pattern then makes resemblances and differences between the two subjects more readily available to the reader. The reader, the reader will remember, if it is a longer piece, the reader will retain the information better than in the chunk pattern, all right? But as I said, but the chunk pattern works fine. It works fine for a very short piece, okay? So, and there, so there's your, your clue, okay? The, there's your choice, okay? Yeah, it's right there in the notes. This type of structure is ideally su suited to long reports and papers where the terms of comparison are complex and, dem and demand higher reader recall. Boom, done. Dynamite, done. Okay, all right. So what I thought then, we can look at just possible ways we could set this up. But then, as I said, I'm going to show you some of the pitfalls, some of the some of the things you should be aware of. The minute you're asked to do something like this, you should be asking questions. All right. And I'm not kidding. Don't put up your hand in front of the whole class. Right. Go down and ask the prof on your own. That way you'll have a bit of an inside track. OK. So. All right. So let's just look at the obvious. S1 and S2 can be compared in terms of A, B and C. I think you see, well, that's not really much of a thesis, correct? This paper, well, it could be maybe four pages. It could be 400 pages. I mean, A, B, and C could go on forever, could they not? So that, 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 that's what I've been trying to show you all along. You have to ask questions about that. How do, like, how do I figure this stuff out, all right? And so one example, again, X and Y can be compared in terms of their power bases, religious backgrounds, and family ties. But notice, notice, I'm still at the bottom of page six here. Notice how vague that sounds. So the question becomes then, well, if I'm asked to do a comparative analysis, what exactly do you want, right, right? Of your other props, I mean, not me, because I'm, I've already made it clear, I don't want you to do one, all right? But I think I'm showing you now, you can see, yes, this can become very vague, all right? And so, okay, going to page seven now, same thing, yeah, S1 and S2, so two different elements, subjects, whatever, can be contrasted in terms of A, B, and C. Well, sure they can, but, all right. A good example, actually, this is a good example, college and university can be contrasted in terms of cost, instruction, and orientation, and they certainly can, right? But again, you see how it doesn't really have, it doesn't have a, an argument at the center of it, right? So better, okay, I'm just, again, just giving you a quick example. Based on A, B, and C, the research indicates the best approach to whatever, like, so your own academic career would be, so notice now how you introduced an argumentative tone into the comparative analysis. Right, so let's do that again. Based on your terms of comparison, right? That's what we started with today. So based on your terms of comparison, the research indicates that the best approach, okay? And again, you know, for your own academic endeavor would be, and then college or university, boom, okay? So that would be, you, you can see how again, we manipulate, sorry, we manipulate the language, but maybe, Maybe your prof didn't want an argument. So again, these are the kind of things we'll end off with, okay, in the next five minutes. Like, like, so what exactly is expected? All right. You can see then how the thesis statement can be problematic when writing a, a comparative analysis, okay? And so that's why I think I'll end the lecture today with just some final thoughts on questions that you may want to consider if you're asked to do this, all right? Be careful, okay, when you generate comparison and or contrast papers, as they can sometimes be very vague. If you're ever right, sorry, if you're ever asked to write a comparative analysis, right, then consider these things. Are you expected to create an argument? In some disciplines, you aren't. And I can't teach you that. I don't know, like I don't have the magic solution to show you, well, how would you do one really effectively? Like I said, totally different type of writing, history, okay, in particular, 
right? For those of you who are history majors, I think you'll understand what I'm, what I'm getting at there. On the other hand, are you simply expected to show similarities and differences, okay? And or differences, okay? One, one or the other or both, right? Will you be expected to propose recommendations? Now, that would be probably more for graduate school or when you are in the workforce, okay? But there may be times where, going back to our computer analysis, right, where, yeah, you're, you're asked to do a comparative analysis on the computers, like to choose which one, and then you will actually recommend. So, and that would be more business writing, business oriented, right? You can look up stuff like that on the web. Very easy to find information about that. Something called a business proposal, okay? I don't think I talked at, at all about that on this course, yeah, um, because it's not business writing. Then, will anyone have to act on your findings? So again, thinking about you know the the computer analysis, uh, maybe you're working in the government and literally like like whatever your recommendations are, someone will actually have to act. So again, though, though that that's a bit more sophisticated. Really, the, the main one, okay, the main one is: Are you supposed to create an argument? So if you're ever asked to do a comparative analysis, that's the number one question. Am I simply expected to show similarities and differences, or am I supposed to make an argument here? And every every professor, every instructor will be different in terms of their expectations, okay? So again, I, I wish I had the magical solution to say, well, this is the way you always do it. Th simply not true, all right? Or at least I can't give you that because as I said, expectations will differ. So as I said, um, comparative analysis, it's not, it's not the best way to go about doing any type of uh, writing assignment, but if you are asked to do it, then at least now you have the different models that you can choose from, all right? And so basically that takes us to the end of the course. Uh, as I said, I may send out an email, you know, a reminder or whatever, um, but I hope you enjoyed the course. Uh, it's uh, It's been trying for, for everyone, right? With, you know, like like being in a virtual environment, um, and I hope you enjoyed my bad jokes along the way, all right? Uh, and yeah, basically, good luck with your academic careers. I wanted to end off with just one one other joke. So let me, let me just finish with this, all right? And this will be the last thing you see from me, all right? I hope you enjoyed the course, or not. Your choice. <laughs> all right, I just had to do that. Sorry, okay? Anyway, take care.